Welcome to Turn a Page, the official comic book club for Nerd Initiative. Each week, the NI Bullpen will be covering the world of comics, talking to creators, deep diving into some fantastic stories, and much more. Now let's hand it over to the team and turn a page. And what is going on, everyone? It is Tuesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and you are tuned in to Nerd Initiative Streaming for another edition of Turn a Page, the official comic book club for Nerd Initiative. My name is Ken M. You know me as the host of the ODPH podcast. I'm also Nerd Initiative Editor-in-Chief. To my left, you're right at home. It's in his contract. He does his own intro. I'm an Agile Live and Direct straight from the ODPH studios. My name's Off the Cuff Tom, Nerd Initiative's pop culture connoisseur. Ken, Dave, always a pleasure. Absolutely. And it's a very special episode indeed because we have a returning guest who is writing some of the best books at the comic shops day in and day out. Whenever you see his name on a book, whether it's Savage Avengers, The Devil That Wears My Face, the upcoming Cable Love and Chrome, you know that you're going to have an absolute hit on your hands. And we are very fortunate that he's taken some time out to talk to us about his newest hit, <gasps> Space Go! from dynamite comics please give a warm welcome to the one and only david pepos david what is going hey. on uh thank you guys so much for having me uh, sorry we are, are kicking things off a, a little a little late um but i am so excited to be chatting with you guys about uh space ghost and uh anything else under the sun uh, about comics uh thank you guys again so much for having me and for the kind introduction and uh yeah i'm thrilled to be here Oh, sorry for your ears. I got a little loud. Yeah, I was going to say my ears are ringing for a little bit, but you know, it's it's hey. very well worth it. And the praise is definitely there, whether it's Spencer and Locke, the OZ. I can go on and on and on about how amazing your work is. And this book too, especially taking the 1966 cartoon character who pop culture has kind of had some different interpretations of over the years. How did this all come about with you and Dynamite Comics and what we have now with the fantastic series? Yeah. Um, so the, the way that Space Coast uh, came into being was um, I've known Nick Barucci at Dynamite for, uh, I think this is 15 years thereabouts, um, dating back to my earliest days as a, as a comics journalist. And so uh, when I struck out on my own as a comics writer, uh, Nick was one of the first people that I would email with my stuff and I would email him and I'd email uh, editor Nate Cosby. And so um, over the years, as I did more and more work, I would always email them. And uh, I think it was around when I did um, Moon Knight, City of the Dead, and the new Ron on Punisher um, that uh, Nate uh, had said, hey, you know what, like, I, I think David is, is is really ready to to do something bigger. Nick felt the same way. And so uh, I was introduced to Joe Ryman, my editor on Space Ghost. And he said, you know, based on the work that you've done on these things, uh, would you have any interest in in the character? And it's so interesting the way that uh, it seems to work in, in, in comics. For me, my introduction to Space Ghost, like many in my generation, was, of course, Coast to Coast. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until my first industry job as a, an intern at DC Comics that I got that I learned that Space Ghost was actually a traditional superhero, sort of molded in, in, in the same mold as uh, Adam West's Batman, it kind of riding that, that, that wave of that hit show. And um, somewhere during that internship, I got a copy of the trade paperback of Space Ghost that Joe Kelly and Ariel Olivetti did. And reading that and learning more about who Alex Toth was, I was kind of struck at, at, at uh, Space Ghost's potential and how he really has all the ingredients to be an A-lister. And I, I remember thinking, I'm surprised that more people haven't done stuff with him. And then you flash forward 15 years and uh, Joe asked me, well, if you had uh, at least a year's worth of runway on Space Ghost, what would you want to do? Um, the light bulb kind of went off. And so I, I rewatched all the original episodes uh, from, the, from the 60s run, uh, wow. the 80s revival in Space Stars. Um, mm -hmm. I reread every comic I could get my hands on. And um, the thing that really struck me was uh, Alex Toth, uh, he did so much heavy lifting as a designer. All of his characters had so much personality and, and, and the vibes were really carried just by the way they looked. And I remember thinking, this is like Space Ghost has a really iconic rogues gallery. It feels like something cut from the same cloth as, as a Batman or a Spider-Man or the Flash. And um, the thing that really kind of made the light bulb go off for me was rereading Joe Kelly and Ariel Olivetti's run um, uh, from 2006. And realizing that that was very much sort of a, a standalone origin story for Space Ghost specifically. But 
rewatching the original cartoons, seeing how much Jan and Jason blip, they were core parts of the show. Um, they really were co-leads in, in, in the same way that Space Ghost was. And that nobody had really told an in-depth story about them. And so that became kind of the emotional through line of my Space Ghost series was I, I wasn't trying to write Batman year one, mm. but instead I was trying to do year one for the twins um, and figuring out kind of how do they go from being these, these orphaned rescues to becoming sidekicks and partners in their own right. And then eventually sort of uh, coming together in this found family unit with Space Ghost and um, it's just been uh, such a treat to get to write this book and seeing the overwhelming response to it. Um, it, it it's it's been one of the, the proudest projects of my career. That's awesome. And yeah, it definitely deserves all the praise because you can definitely tell you're having some fun with this. And it's just been such an incredible read about it, too. Like I said, it's one of the most sought after books amongst our entire comics team here at Nerd Initiative. Yep. Whenever it comes out, like everybody's like, oh, can I review it? Can I review it? Because everybody just really is in love with the take in the series that you're doing here. I just sit Thank back you. back and ask for the review copy just to read it. Because everybody <laughs> else just wants to review it. <laughs> just thought, yeah, you well, guys do uh, Yeah, I mean, it, I, I, it, it means the world to hear you guys say that. Um, yeah, I think I think something that you'd said earlier early on is that Space Ghost has had a lot of different interpretations uh, over over the years. And if anything, I'd say every generation Space Ghost kind of comes back and reinvents himself in, in some mm -hmm. way. Um, yeah. You know, like I said, the, the original 60s run, um, that was uh, in response to Adam West's Batman. Um, and it has that kind of Silver Age uh, uh, camp to it, but also kind of this boundless sci-fi energy that Alex Toth imbued in everything. And then, of course, you have the 80s revival, which is sort of standing shoulder to shoulder with Super Friends and Spider-Man is Amazing Friends and sort of the, the, the rise of toys being kind of a driver for, for, for animation. Um, you have Coast to Coast, which I think it was, you know, a, a mainstay for the MTV generation, you know, really kind of establishing that ironic mm -hmm. tone that has permeated through comedy for, for, three, for three decades since. Um, and then, of course, you know, Joe Kelly's run, uh, which kind of captured, it came out just before Batman Begins, but you wouldn't know it, having read it. It, it sort of rode that zeitgeist. Um, so that was kind of my directive going into this, was if you're going to reinvent Space Ghost every generation, what would Space Ghost look like in the year 2024? Uh, what kind of storytelling methodology and techniques can we use um, to try to tell a story that speaks to the diehard fans um, from every generation, but also introduces the character for for a brand new cohort of readers who have no idea who he is um i think everybody is a, is a space ghost fan they just don't know it yet and so I, i've been so excited to to get to reintroduce that character for for a brand new generation of fans and uh hopefully uh, get to remind uh, some of our veteran fans why they love the character in the first place you know you say that very in interestingly that space ghost is a generational uh, thing. What do you, and this is just a, an odd opinion. Do you think that because they were running off of the bat tales of Adam West and then we've had so much camp that that's why he's always considered her a C or a D leaguer. Um, and you know, is that what you really wanted to try and get away from now? As far as I'm concerned, I knew the cartoon as a kid. So I knew the old sixties cartoon. I knew the eighties yeah. cartoon. I had never picked up a comic up until this one. So, you know, I might be a little biased too. Well, I think it's 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 been more of just uh, they've never really had the opportunity to 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 really dig into the character. I mean, I think that was something that was so fun and exciting for me for Space Ghost uh, to be able to work on this as a comic. Is uh, you know, for for every superhero you've seen the umpteenth reiteration of the character, um, no. you know, it sort of relaunches and reboots and different takes on the same character are kind of part and parcel for the genre at this point. It's been very well mined over the course of, you know, since, since what, the first Iron Man movie? Um, you mm -hmm. could even argue since the first Nolan Batman movie. Um, Space Ghost is kind of virgin territory in a, in a genre that doesn't have a lot of that. And while, of course, there have been sort of these, these generational stabs at the character, um, it's not, it hasn't been, you know, particularly dug into that deeply. Um, the original Space Ghost series, of course, they were operating at five minute increments. There's not a lot of time for backstory. There's very little in the way of continuity or any sort of interconnectivity between the episodes up until the introduction of the Council of Doom at the end of that first run. Um, and, you know, uh, in, in Space Stars, you, you only have a handful of recurring villains there as well. 
Um, so I don't think it's, I don't think it's, I, I think it's the reason why people aren't as familiar with the characters. There have been very different takes um, and they, and they do, they all always are a product of their generation of their environment. Um, so yeah, of course you've got like the silver age, you know, if, if you hadn't told us a, a, a Batman story after Adam West Batman, that would be the association you bring to it. Right. Uh, and, you know, coast to coast, I think had a really indelible mark on the character. I liken it to uh, having preserved Space Ghost in Amber. You know, it kept Space Ghost's name out there. It kept it, it kept him alive. Yeah. I don't think we would have a Space Ghost uh, comic in the year 2024 without coast to coast. Um, but at the same time, it sort of preserved the bones that Alex Toth had built for that character. Um, and the fact that nobody's really been able to dig that deeply into it. Um, even Joe Kelly, Joe Kelly and Ariel Olivetti had a six issue run um, in their series. I know in Future Quest, Space Ghost kind of only bookended that um, and then had kind of a short Metallus arc in the pages of Future Quest Presents. Um, so yeah, it's really, it's virgin territory. So I think it's just there, there hasn't been an opportunity for people to get to know the character. Um, but I think, and I think this is a trend that we're seeing all over the place, is that people want something new in the superhero genre. And that's why you see things like, uh, you know, uh, the absolute line and DC, the ultimate mm -hmm. line, of Marvel, uh, that they're so popular because people are able to take these very fresh new takes on a familiar property. We're able to take that one step further because you may have heard of Space Ghost, you may think of them as talk show host, but chances are you probably don't know the kind of wide sweeping universe, the the, the uh, incredible rogues gallery, the uh, amazing supporting cast, just this vibrant universe that Alex Toth built. I think it's just been prime for uh, for for another look for for many, many years. And I feel very fortunate to, to be part of the team that's able to do it. Yeah. And I would say since Space Coast has been around since 1966, I mean, to, what do you think is the biggest connection with him in the audience? Because, I mean, we've had yeah. the different interpretations, but like when you're writing it and when you're think, starting to think about it, like what do you think is the biggest connection to the audience that like really makes him stand out? Sure. Well, I think uh, I think it, it really it comes down to that design. Um, mm -hmm. Space Ghost design by Alex Toth is just it's classic. It's timeless. It feels cutting edge. It's really, it's a really interesting thing that, of course, borrows from like some of the cool iconography of a Batman, but also kind of meshes in like the 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 the, the retro sci-fi of a, of a Buck Rogers or a Flash Gordon. Mm -hmm. um, I think you know, and I think that that also extends to the villains. And I think you know, a hero is only as good as his villains. And Space Ghost has such an amazing. Yep rogues gallery you know you see zorak you see metallus you see moltar you see brack you see the widow you see creature king um each of those characters just one look at them you're like huh i wonder what their deal is and then mm -hmm. they all have very interesting kind of core concepts to to each of them um and that was i think a real treat for me uh, is being able to watch those old episodes and say okay like what is it about brack that stands out to me and then what kind of small twist can I add to each of these characters that plays that up? Um, so well we done Brack. on that. Well done. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, like Brack, you know, he's not out there looking to conquer the world. Um, he, he's he got a kind of a blue collar. Uh, uh, his, his aspirations are more blue collar. He's out looking to rob the nearest gold freighter with his brother, Sisto. And so I thought, oh, that's kind of fun. Like, you know, um, kind of a, a, a street level kind of crook in a lot of ways and how do you play up that opportunistic streak and so you know spoilers it was our first issue so you've had time to read it um mm -hmm. you know we made him and sisto and in, in, we, we made them corrupt cops and that way we we're able to kind of pull double duty of we could have a surprise uh you know uh, bringing in these iconic villains from the jump but also to explain well why doesn't space ghost take jan and jason blip and just drop them off at the nearest police station um, you know, it's a, it's a big universe out there and, and there's a lot of uh, crime and corruption. And that means that really Space Ghost is the only one that these kids can trust. And that sort of uh, cements their relationship into becoming sort of this found family of crime fighters. Um, so being able to do that with all the villains has been a real treat. But I think it all comes down to um, Alex Toth is a genius uh, and, and, and the designs that he left us. Um, 
I've always said that the writing space ghost feels like being invited into like a, a like a five star kitchen and being given all the best choicest ingredients and being told nobody's made a meal out of this. Um, try making something out of it. And so mm. uh, it's a real gift as it's as a, a storyteller. Movie. Um, and just, it's a little daunting, uh, for sure. But I think these characters are so inherently cool and interesting that I haven't had any issues, uh, finding uh, new and interesting wrinkles to bring out of them. Yeah. I think it's funny when I was reading Brack and Sisto, you know, what other sci-fi characters came to mind to me? Yeah. The Ferengis from DS9. Oh yeah. You know, I can absolutely see that. I can totally okay. see that. Um, you know, you know, we'll, we'll work and nog, you know. When I was writing them, um, and granted, you know, that first issue was very interesting. We had a very accelerated time frame uh, on our first issue. We wanted to make sure that we had uh, a preview ready for the retailers at Comics Pro. So uh, that issue, this whole series has come together very quickly, but that issue in particular came together really in, in, in double time. And seeing the way that Jonathan Lau, uh, our artist in the book, and just a, an amazing collaborator, the way yeah. that he reimagined Brack and Sisto, I thought was really cool and really interesting. And um, yeah, just, uh, you know, I kind of wrote them. Uh, I thought I thought a lot about Taskmaster from, from Marvel um, mm -hmm. and sort of my, my, my writing of those characters. Um, something that felt kind of very earthy and down to earth um, and, and, and a little bit more slangy and casual. And um, yeah, Brack, Brack's a lot of fun to write. Um, and and uh, yeah, it's been just really interesting to be able to find these different voices for these different characters. And uh, uh, who knows? It'll be really interesting uh, maybe if we uh, see them all in the same room someday. Ooh. Ooh. That'll be kind of fun. Now, speaking of being in the room, um, what are your thoughts? And now we're talking broad in the yeah. big picture. What's your thoughts on Dynamite re revitalizing and bringing new life into classic franchises, such as like Space Ghost, Barbarella, Buck Rogers, all those great older franchises, or even more modern franchises like even Thundercats? Yeah, I you know I've been so impressed, particularly with this new Warner Brothers line that uh, Dynamite's been doing. Um, you know, and it was a real honor to kind of follow up. Uh, the 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 high bar that Declan Shelby and Drew Moss set with Thundercats, um, and so yeah, I feel like uh, it really kind of put the, my feet to the fire a little bit uh, to make sure that we were I was delivering my absolute best possible work for that because uh, Joe Ryban approached me. They had just announced that initiative. Um, they had just announced. Declan and Drew on Thundercats at New York Comic Con. And that's mm -hmm. when they mm -hmm. approached me about this book. So, um, you know, it was, it, was, it was certainly daunting, but I think you see the enthusiasm um, that people are bringing to Thundercats and Space Ghost and Johnny Quest and, and Powerpuff Girls. And uh, I know they've got Wizard of Oz coming and they've got, uh, they announced a, a second round of uh of of warner brothers properties that they're gonna be doing mm -hmm. comics on uh in in the months and years to come and um yeah just the fact that people's people i think are clamoring for this stuff and i think it goes back to what i was talking about earlier and that comic fans um they want new stuff and not to say that um you know i i think in in this case like they know a lot of what's going on at the big two and they love those characters of course um, but being able to kind of take that same approach and care for a property that hasn't gotten as much love over the last however many years, um, I think people are really excited for that. And I think you see it in Dynamite, you see it in Skybound's uh, Energon line, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you know, uh, <laughs> you know, even, even uh, you see, you know, Oni doing interesting stuff um, uh, over the, and then the cell line. Um, and of course, Boom, I think, was kind of a pioneer of all this with uh, what they did on Power Rangers and um, IDW revitalizing Ninja Turtles. Um, I think people, they see the the the, the quality of, uh, uh, of the caliber of work that big two creators are bringing to the Marvel and DC characters. And what we're seeing now is that we're being able to spread the wealth and we're being able to take that same, those same storytelling sensibilities that have made Marvel and DC so popular. And then we're able to kind of spread them out onto more and more properties that people are excited about that have, they have affection for, or they're curious about. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's good for readers. It's good for creators. It's good for retailers. It's good for the industry. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, of course I can say all this kind of in hindsight, um, right. you know, 
certainly had no idea that this was going to be the trend when I signed up. But yeah, it's just been, um, I, I feel really honored to kind of be part of the club uh, in, in all of this and to see people responding to these books um, as positively as they have been. Um, it's been really nice. Um, so yeah. Can I, I, I if you talk to the yeah. Thundercats guys, can you can you suggest to go back to the 2011 series? I really would appreciate bookending that. Sure. Uh, you know, I know so Declan. They, they dropped the ball, Cartoon Network. Declan has been a, a buddy for a long time. I, I I knew him back when he was working on 28 Days Later over at Boom. So wow. I've probably okay. known him close to 15 years as well. And, um, you know, hearing a little bit about some of the plans that he's got in store for, for Thundercats, I know he's he's being very ambitious uh, with this. And, and I know this is sort of his, his X-Men in a lot of ways. Um, mm. And I think he and Dynamite, I think, see this as uh, a franchise with a lot of room to grow, a lot of room to expand, um, a really a room die to hard twenty eleven series. <clears throat> you know, um, <laughs> so yeah, keep keep uh, keep keep speaking out. Um, I'm sure that uh, you know if if, if Declan and, and and Nick Barucci uh, uh, have their say, they're going to be exploring as many corners of the Thundercats universe as possible. So uh, I'm sure. Uh, never say never. I I don't know any anything. I promise, uh, but. Yeah, uh, they've got some really cool stuff uh, 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 planned, and I, I know Declan's very excited about that book. Yeah, I mean, like I said, there's a lot of great books out, especially, you know, recapturing a lot of these classic characters and giving them new life. And one thing, too, especially like we touched upon, Space Ghost has been around since 1966. Was there any idea that you've had that knowing the legacy of the character it was, it was kind of like steering against like i really want to do this but i don't know how this would fit in or has it really been kind of like a wide open playbook like whatever you want to do you know here's the here's your free yeah. reign. no it's been pretty wide open um you know i i can count on one hand the number of times that um i've been told uh, and and when i say i've been told to make changes it's like hey can you change this line or okay. um I know when we did our uh, our Zorak issue, um, the licensor was like, hey, this panel here where like there's a blood splatter, can we make that a silhouette? You know, um, so they've been, Warner Brothers has been uh, really wonderful, uh, uh, by far the best licensor I've ever worked with by a wide margin. Um, they've really given us a lot of freedom to kind of uh, 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 take the ball and run with it. And it's been, yeah, it, it's sort of, it's all the fun of the superhero genre without having to kind of navigate um, the traffic patterns that come usually in a shared superhero universe. You know, I don't have to ask anybody's permission if I want to use Zorak. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just get to say, I want to use Zorak and here's what I'm planning. And are you cool with that? And, and when I had pitched my initial pitch to uh, Warner Brothers, I pitched them 13 issues. It was a 32 page document, I think I pitched them. Um, so I went pretty in depth on what my plans were for Space Ghost. And um, I've only made, I made some slight deviations on on um, one issue. Uh, I, I, I realized I kind of didn't flesh out the subplot enough and so I reworked that. But um, yeah, I mean, the licensor is basically approved all of my preliminary plans uh, for, for, for Space Ghost. And um, yeah, and there's room for more. Um, so yeah, it's been, uh, it's, it's really been uh, a lot of latitude. Um, and I don't think there's been any, I think the only thing that I have had is there are certain villains that I knew I wanted to use. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, like, like when you're doing a book like this with this many cool villains, you think, okay, like I need to make sure that we fit in, you know, the core Council of Doom uh you know uh characters um but you know somebody like tanza for example where like i was like okay that guy feels he doesn't feel like he could sustain his own full length issue at least based on on his uh, original cartoon characterization but he feels too important to let go so there are some characters that we sort of fit in a little bit more in like cameo spots um there are other there are other villains though that i was like mm, i don't want to i don't want to make them just cameos um, you know, they feel like they, they're too cool to just leave as a cameo. Um, maybe I'll leave them in the back pocket in case we get to do more. Um, and so there's there's been a little bit of, of, of feeling that out. But um, yeah, just um, 
yeah, it's there been a lot of freedom in this book, which has been uh, really, really wonderful. And it's really kind of uh, uh, got my creative juices flowing. No, that's great to hear, because I you know a lot of times, especially when you have a, a you know, a, a character or property that is been around for so long, the legacy is there. And a lot of times it's kind of like, how far can you go in a different direction than what the pop culture audience is used to? And I mean, obviously, Space Ghost has had many interpretations, but it's just making sure like you as a creator are just allowed to let, you know, your mind go you know crazy and go, hey, I want to try doing this. Have we ever done this with a character? And that I think that's like the appeal of what we're seeing a lot now in comics, where there's a real drive to push characterization first and really make that a forefront. Yeah. Well, and I, I think it all goes back to for Space Ghost in particular. Um, you know, there's there's so much uh, uh, potential that hasn't been tapped with the character. I mean, you think you look back at, say, the Joe Kelly and Ariel Olivetti run where that was Space Ghost. Um, that was his origin story. And it was him going from becoming a space cop to being kind of left for dead on an alien planet and then coming back as this like phantom uh vigilante. And so like, for example, that it was really him versus corrupt cops and mm. Zora makes an appearance in there. Um, but even he's not like the central villain of, of, of the piece or anything. And um, you know uh, when you see Space Ghost again in Future Quest. That's a big ensemble piece, but you know the, it's sort of this 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 Omnicron uh, 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 interdimensional alien. Um, and in Future Quest Presents, you the the arc was about Metallus. So there's all these other characters. I mean, you know, Brack and Sisto um, have never been explored really in in in, in the comics. Um, you know, uh, the widow Creature King, who I love. Who you know, the last time we saw anything with Creature King was in a five minute spot on the Brave and the Bold. Um, you know, there's a lot of characters in here that just have never been really explored beyond, you know, 15 to 20 minutes in the original cartoons across three yeah. to four episodes each. Um, there's a lot of material to play with here. And I think uh, that was a very early decision that I made in this series was to do a lot of done in ones and done in twos. Um, I knew that when I had pitched this book, I had 13 issues of runway, 12 issues in an annual to be precise. And I said, okay, um, if I, if that's my only runway, um, how do I hit as many of these villains as possible? So that mm -hmm. way, when you've read this series, even though it feels like 13 issues, it's sort of like Batman, the long Halloween, it feels longer because you're doing all these self-contained adventures. And so you're racking up these adventures and you're racking up all these wins against villains, um, and that I think allows our readers to feel a little closer with Space Ghost and, and, and Jan and Jace and um, get to know them better than um, what like a, a five issue arc might entail. Yeah, that, I mean, it's definitely a, a, you know, a key point, too, because like I say, you're packing so much in the series and even with five issues out right now, I mean, there's a lot going on, but it's it's something you can definitely feel like it's it's taken its time to build up and that you're really making those connections, especially where we left off with issue five too, which I don't want to yeah. spoil right now. I'm going to really push everybody to go to the comic shops and definitely go track down the series if you haven't done it already. Yes. Now, because you've been playing in, in the big, huge universe of Space Ghost Toy Box, um, what and you've gone on and on about the villains, how you either want to make them a cameo or a little bit more than a cameo or make them a central villain in each book, what has been your personal one that's absolute favorite to write at, write for? Boy, that is, it's tough because it, it really is kind of choosing between my babies. Cause I don't think there's really a dud amongst them. Um, okay. Top know, three, top three. We'll okay. give you top three. Top three. Um, uh, Zorak for sure. Yeah. Um, Metallus has been a lot of fun. Um, and I think my third place, it's a toss up between um, Creature King and the Widow. Um, okay. Okay. I, I, would, I, I would say Widow is more fun to write, but the story that we have coming with Creature King might be my favorite issue of, of the run. So, um, but yeah, I think I think Zorak and Metallus um, in particular have been a lot of fun. Um, I'm working on the back half of the Metallus two-parter right now. Um, okay. And yeah, it's sort of um, it's it's sort of the biggest scale issue I think we've done to date um, that 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 the two-parter. Um, so yeah, um, but like I said, Alex Toth left us a lot of fun stuff and 
there is another villain coming that um, I haven't started writing yet that could steal the show. We'll see. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm I'm very excited to kind of play around with them and and, and figure out their voice and and, and um, figure out how Jonathan portrays them because I think that'll go a long way. Um, so yeah, stay tuned. Um, issue ten might be pretty interesting too. Okay. Well, I'm locked and loaded on the series. And I, like I say, I, I love to take you to a Zorak because especially like knowing where I've seen him before and now to see this and just absolutely, you know, uh, like I'll quote uh, TJ in the chat there. Uh, was it always your plan to have him be an absolute maniac? Yes, uh, because yes. he just, yeah, he just sells, like I say, that, that picture was just up on the screen too, that Great. panel. That's like your introduction there. And it's like, whoa, like, okay, this is definitely <laughs> not Space Ghost Coast to Coast by any stretch of the imagination. Here. No. Um yeah, Jonathan Lau really knocked that page uh, out of the park. Um, when I saw those inks come in, I was like, "Okay, I think I think this book is safe. I think I think people are going to really like this." And Andrew Dalhouse uh, really elevated it with with his colors. Um, but yeah, when I pitched Zorak to Warner Brothers, it was sort of the first idea that I had had um, as far as all the characters were concerned, and I, I pitched him as uh, the Charles Manson of space. Um, and, you know, that, that it's not just that he's crazy and it's not mm -hmm. just that he, like exudes this dangerous aura. Um, but also, you know, he's a cult leader, like he's somehow drawn all these other people into his orbit. And I think the, the thing that kind of clicked everything together was, um, you know, I thought, oh, cool, like a Charles Manson figure. But what does what does he believe? Um, because that's really kind of the crux of a character like that. And um, as I was kind of thinking of other characters to fit in, um, I had been thinking at the at the time, I was like, oh, you know, there's Lokar. I don't really know what I want to do with Lokar. Maybe I leave Lokar out. And then I realized, oh, wait, why don't I pair the bug characters together? <laughs> um, uh, especially since they, they had that rivalry going in Coast to Coast. Um, but having Zorak be this apostle of a low car cult and mm. introducing low car as this Lovecraftian, a nihilist kind of figure um, um, coming from, from this, this, this evil dimension. Um, that's when the whole thing clicked. And I was like, oh, okay, I figured out my two-parter. Um, yeah. I figured out how do we make this, uh, this scale uh, uh, bigger and, you know, it's sort of you see Space Ghost and these twins a little bit out of their depth um, that they've been they've been fighting kind of street level crime up to this point. And just by virtue of being you could call it the right place at the right time, you could call it the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, mm. Suddenly it's 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 they're the only thing saving the galaxy. Um, and I thought that was kind of a cool way to escalate things, um, but also to really kind of remind readers and remind Jan and Jace that. Um, these are life and death situations that they're 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 playing with here, and uh, finding a way to kind of subvert the escape fantasy of being a sidekick. Uh, you think it's all fun and games, being able to go out on patrol with Space Ghost, um, and as you can see, uh, poor Jace, um, mm -hmm. you know he um, he's learned that there's you know it's not all fun and games, and there's a, there's a there there's a price to pay uh, if you want to save the galaxy. Yeah. Like I say, issue issue five, if you have not picked it up yet, everybody needs to go check it out because, like I say, it's going to be one that leaves quite the impression there yes. uh, with everything going on, too. And yes. especially like for you know readers that are just jumping in, this is going to be a lot of their first Space Ghost memories. What is the memory that you have that instantly made you like, I'm a Space Ghost fan? Mm, um, you know, I honestly, I think the thing that really kind of uh, stood out for me um you know, boy, I, th I think it was the Brave and the Bold episode. Um, okay. Seeing him teaming up with Batman, um, uh, uh, fighting Creature King. I think that took all the sort of Space Ghost knowledge that I had accumulated over the years, you know, with Coast to Coast and then learning about Alex Toth when I was a DC intern and reading Joe Kelly and Ariel Olivetti's run. Um, I watched that um, episode uh, years back and it all kind of clicked for me. And I was kind of like, Oh, I get it. Like he's super fun and he has all the cool stuff that Batman does, but also he borrows from all the cool, like star Wars kind of sci-fi. Mm -hmm. And it made me understand Jan and Jace a lot better. Um, because, 
you can tell a Batman story without Robin and it still feels organic. You know? yeah, but yeah. Um, Jays have been with Space Ghost since the beginning. And I, I maintain you really can't tell a true Space Ghost story. Um, I mean, Coast to Coast notwithstanding, because uh, that does uh, often feel like its own animal. Um, I don't think you can tell a traditional Space Ghost story without Jan and Jace. It's like trying to make a banana split without the banana. It just, mm -hmm. you know, doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, I think Space Ghost is inherently an ensemble piece. Um, and I think that does extend whether you're talking about uh, the original series or you're talking about Coast to Coast. I think um, that is a character that is built to play off of others. And I think Jan and Jace... Um, it just makes a lot of sense. I drew a lot from Jurassic Park with that characterization, uh, with um, uh, Tim and Lex as, okay. as Jan and Jace and, and Space Ghost as our grumpy Dr. Grant. Mm. Um, and I think uh, watching that uh, relationship and dynamic evolve on an issue to issue basis, that was sort of the core thing that I was coming up with every single time I was structuring an issue was who's the villain and how does this change that, that, that relationship with Space Ghost and the kids? Um, it's funny. It was, it was only a couple issues in that I realized how autobiographical it all was for me. Um, my, my younger siblings are triplets and, um, they were born a week and a half before my ninth birthday. And I feel like, I felt like the dinosaur right as the meteor was hitting, you know, um, just my whole, my whole way of life just completely exploded. And, um, you know, I was kind of learning everything again on the fly is like a very stressed out nine-year-old mm -hmm. and i'm realizing that that's that space ghost to a t is you know it was this lone brooding vigilante who was kind of fighting in the shadows by himself all these years and suddenly he's charged with taking care of two kids and a monkey and it's how does his life irrevocably change from that but also how does it get better how does this character who just by virtue of the mask he wears and the names he, he the name he has taken, he's purposely pushed down his own humanity in the mm -hmm. face of overwhelming loss and tragedy. And what happens when he's kind of forced to confront that humanity again, thanks to these two irrepressible kids who find their own degree of, of hope and salvation in Space Ghost. Um, so it really is, it's a, it's a found family story. And I think those are always my favorite to write. So I do think that this series in many ways, um, I think speaks to some of my favorite things in storytelling. Now, what are some of the things you're planning now? We know we only got 13 to go with, uh, what are some of the things you're kind of planning for in the long run? And then additionally, you kept going on about, you know, all the characters in Space Ghost and everything, you know, that has been laid out. Is there anything you want to do in the long run as far as adding something not necessarily new, new to the storyline, but as far as maybe a new character, a new villain? I mean, you've got such icon the iconography in Space Ghost is a representation of the time in 1960s. What can we do, could we do in 2024? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of villains uh, out there that I think are really interesting. Um, you know, uh, like the Antimatter Man, the, the Eclipse Woman. Um, mm. You know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Tarkos the Terrible. Uh, I got a real soft spot for that guy. Um, you know, there's there's a number of really cool villains out there that, uh, you know, write your congressman. Maybe maybe there will be some more runway for the big sport. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I think, um, yeah, I, I it's it's one of those things, you know, I, I have an inkling of, of what I would do with more runway for, the, for that series. Um, you know, ultimately it's, you, you want to make sure that you have the right story for it. You know, I would, mm -hmm. I would much rather leave wanting audiences wanting more than, to have audiences be like, oh, Pepo's overstayed is welcome. Um, but yeah, I think there's some really interesting ways to kind of keep expanding the Space Ghost universe and to keep kind of exploring uh, the different places that he can go. Um, but yeah, I think it ultimately comes down to um, it's the kids, you know, it's, it's Space Ghost with these kids and how do you keep kind of evolving that dynamic? Because I think that's ultimately what's most interesting to me is, um, you know, seeing Space Ghost not just rise to the occasion as a superhero defending the innocent, but also as kind of this like surrogate parent figure um, and, and, and 
how he is overwhelmed um, because of course you get two teenage twins and, and their pet monkey dropped in your lap. That's a big yeah. life change. Yeah. Um, but I think that's, what's so interesting to me is that he's, he's a grouch. Um, you know, he, he, he doesn't necessarily know how to deal with kids. Sometimes he's a little rough on them, but there's this inherent core of nobility to him that he will, he will protect these kids with his life. Um, he will, he will risk the universe for them. Um, he, you know, he made a promise to keep those kids safe. And I think that is kind of the, the mission statement of our whole series. The last page of the first issue, um, you know, Jan says there's, there's no one left. Um, it's just us now. And space goes, goes, no, I'm here. And I think that mm -hmm. is, that's what makes him a hero. It's not punching out the bad guys. It's something that my uh, editor on cable and, and my longtime editor at Marvel, Tom Brevoort, has really impressed upon me. And I, I call it the Brevoort rule. Um, a superhero is not a superhero because he punches out supervillains. A superhero is a superhero because he protects the innocent. And uh, that's something that I've really tried to instill in Space Ghost and something that it's been really fun to see Jan and Jay's paying forward uh, as his sidekicks is uh, we always make it a point that there's always innocent lives at stake. Um, because that's the thing that makes a hero a hero. Yeah. And especially that mic drop moment at the end of issue one, too, like you alluded <laughs> to, that was just like the perfect way to end it. It was like, you know, anybody that reads that, how, if you're not hooked on that series, uh, go check your pulse. Like, honestly, like that is the <laughs> moment that just really solidifies if there was any doubt about this. And to kind of even flip it to the pop culture, I mean, obviously Space Ghost has done the TV shows, is now in comics. I mean, if there's a possibility for a movie ever for Space Ghost, who would you cast in the lead role? I got mine. John Hamm. Same. That's it. Oh, we did not script this, no. ladies and gentlemen. But that, yeah, that just happened. I had it written that's down. Funny. Yeah. Um. Uh. That. That is. That. That's been kind of my voice for Space Ghost in in my head. Uh. As as I've been writing it. Um. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. I think. I think John Hamm's the guy. Um. So. Uh. And you know. Uh. Fun fact is that he and I are from the same hometown. Uh, we're both from really? St. Louis. So, uh, yes. So from one favorite son of St. Louis to another, uh, have your people call my people. Uh, let's get something going. I would love to see. That. I mean, I, I could speak for a lot of people that would love to see that. I mean, Space Ghost movie written by you and then have John Ham star. Can, can we start a hashtag ham for Space Ghost? Yeah, I, there you go. I would not I would not be unopposed to it by any means. <laughs> Well, I mean, obviously you said Space Ghost is going 12 issues thus far. Uh, do you have more stories lined up, uh, you know, to go past 12? Uh, you, you know, I, I, I've got some ideas kind of brewing in the back pocket just in case. Um, you know, uh, we'll see. I, I, I want to make sure that I stick the landing on our, it's, mm -hmm. we're doing 12 issues in an annual uh, for starters. And so I want to make sure that we get that uh, uh, sewn up um, as, as tightly as possible. Um, I'm in the middle of scripting or dialoguing issue nine uh, right now as we speak. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I'm having a lot of fun with it. Um, you know, Jonathan Lau has been such an amazing collaborator to work with. So I think, um, you know, if the stories are there and they feel right and Jonathan's still there, um, I would stick around for as long as Dynamite would have me. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, everybody needs to make sure this happens. You got to make sure you go out buy multiple copies of the yes. series. Not just one. You need to boost that up and just really buy this because honestly, you're getting your money's worth. There's so much adventure, action. Uh, you know, even like the the, the there's the, heart. Yeah, there's heart to it. Like I say, the the family side that you can kind of see with him and the two young children, and you know, with Blip in, in the mix too. Like I say, there's so much in this that it's not just like your traditional superhero story. And thank you for not making Blip purple or blue or whatever color he was before. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, uh, you're thinking Gleek from uh, Super Friends. Oh, that's the yeah, word. You're thinking Sorry. Super Friends. All those, all those well, monkeys. It, it, but, you know, that speaks to the, I think, enduring nature of Space Ghost is, um, you know, like they basically ripped off Jan, Jason, Blip in mm -hmm. Super Friends, um, you know, the, with the Wonder Twins and Gleek. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and I think it was, that was something that really struck me um, rewatching the original episodes because, you know, having read uh, the Joe Kelly comic, I was kind of like, oh, like, you know, Jan and Jace feel, you know, they, 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 they didn't feel as front and center. And then you're watching the heat thing. You're like, oh, no, Jan and Jace show up before Space Ghost. Uh, they are very core, important parts of it. I think it was very forward thinking. I don't know if it was like like a, like an early kind of focus group or, or what. But, um, you know, having a character like Jace that young boys could be like, oh, that's that's me. But also then having Jan, so young girls could watch the show and be like, oh, that's me. 
And then having blip, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a well-known anecdote that, uh, you know, if DC wanted a goose sales that month, they'd throw a monkey on the cover, you know? And so having a monkey is the mascot. Like it makes a lot of sense. Is that um, why the chip has stayed around so long? Maybe, know, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, I think, I think it was very ahead of its time, but I think that that's been a very effective way to have multiple point of view characters in this book. Um, you know, in the same way that like Kitty Pride or Jubilee, you know, were point of view characters when they were introduced. Um, I think doing that has been a way to kind of keep the series fresh, but to also kind of make sure that the emotional heart of the series remains front and center. Because I think without that, all the sci-fi spectacle, no one's going to care. Yeah, that makes sense. Obviously, Space Ghost is taken up front and center stage, but I know you got a couple other projects that are coming out. I mean, one, especially at the top of the year uh, for 2025, which, I mean, wow. it's already taken my money now. So, I mean, <laughs> if you, why don't you let us know what's going on with what you have going on in the rest of 2024 and beyond here? Yeah. So, um, yeah, starting in, in, in January, um, my, my new Marvel miniseries, uh, Cable, Love and Chrome. Uh, will be coming out. Um, I'm so excited to be uh, uh, continuing to work with my longtime editor, Tom Brevoort. Uh, 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 getting to join him in the X-Men office has been super fun. I've been so excited. Um, yeah, I've been working on that book for, for a minute. Uh, you know, uh, he, uh, Tom and I have been talking about this book since uh, it was probably, I think we started talking about it in February. So it's 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 been a long time coming. Um, yeah, you know, the thing that we were discussing is, you know, how do we tell a different kind of cable story? Um, and, and the idea of, um, cable, uh, uh, having a love interest and sort of how do we tell a, a, a romance story in the context of a cable story, uh, where we're leaning into all the, like over the, the larger than life action, the, the cool sci-fi time travel of it all. Um, how do we kind of, uh, uh fit this very human emotion in this kind of high flying sci-fi spectacle that is cable and so um the way that we wound up talking about it is um this is very much a story about the techno organic virus um, and i think that's the thing that's so interesting about cable to me is that um, in the x-men you have other time travelers and you have other telepaths and, and telekinetics for me the thing that is so interesting and fascinating and complicated about cable as a character is he's a time traveler who's living on borrowed time um, mm -hmm. he's somebody who is dealing with a chronic terminal condition that he is spending every minute of his life managing and um, for so long that is something that he has been alone in um, that even, you know, whether it's X-Force or whether it's uh, Cyclops and, and Jean Grey, um, you know, whether it's even Domino, he's always been fighting this battle alone. And what happens when he meets someone who's facing the exact same thing that he is? Um, so the, the the way I wound up pitching it was uh, Edge of Tomorrow meets The Fault in Our Stars, uh, but oh, with the techno organic oh, virus. Um, and it's been a really fun uh, series to be working on. Um, getting to kind of like zero in on Cable's unique voice has been very fun. Um, and figuring out different ways to just how do we play up Cable as this larger than life guy? Um, mm -hmm. So how do we have big action moments in every single issue? Um, and uh, 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 our, our artist, uh, Mike Henderson, is just phenomenal. Um, I've been a huge fan of Mike since his work on Nailbiter. Um, when uh, Tom told me that Mike was going to be drawing the book, I was overjoyed because I had just finished uh, reading uh, an issue of The Forged uh, that he's been working on with uh, mm. Greg Rocca over at Image. And I was like, oh, he's perfect. Like, he knows how to do these kind of big action pack, larger than life characters. He's able to do the tech of it all. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, how I many pouches? <laughs> uh, as, as, as many as Mike can draw. Um, yes. but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about that, that, that book. Um, you know, I'm sort of able to lean into, I love writing action. I love doing choreography, but I think being able to lean into the, the time travel of it all and to lean into what's the mindset of a character like Cable who, mm -hmm. um, you know, is dealing with his own heartbreak, um, you know, as many of the X-Men characters are after the fall of Krakoa, but I think, without spoiling too much cable has i think his own unique heart heartache that he needs to heal from and i think this is kind of an an interesting opportunity to be able to explore and examine that 
Um, so lots of fun stuff, uh, plus the debut uh, of an all-new cable villain that I'm very excited for people to, to see and know. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, uh, stay tuned on that. Um, Ian Churchill is doing uh, covers on the book. I just right. saw his cover for issue two, and I was blown away. Um, I've been a huge fan of Ian's. Uh, this is dating me a little bit, but um, since his work on uh, Heroes Reborn, um, uh, his uh, issue of Avengers uh, yep. for Industrial Revolution, I, as a kid, drew and redrew his Iron Man many times. Um, so <laughs> having Ian working on covers on, on, on one of my books is uh, feels like a real full circle moment. And he's doing fantastic work. Mike is doing fantastic work. Um, I'm really excited for people to get to, to, to read this book. No, absolutely. Like I said, the minute I saw you tagged with cable, I'm like, okay, I'm already buying it. Like I don't need, the, I don't need much more, but now I'm like, I'm completely sold on because cable is just such a multi-layered character. And you talk about a character like much like space ghost, you've seen different incarnations of him throughout the years since he debuted in new mutants way back when. And then to see yeah. like where he is now, like there's so much to his character that to go in this route like this is such an interesting take thank you yeah. um yeah um you know i mean i can attribute a lot of that to, to to my wife um you know when when tom first approached me about this story and and, and we were talking about you know doing sort of a, a time travel romance and i remember thinking there was something missing there was a missing ingredient somewhere and um we walked around our nearby park and and my wife said um you know what tell me, just tell me about the character. Like what, what, just tell me everything that you can think of. And so I was t talking to her about the, you know, the time travel element. And I was talking about the techno organic virus and how this is a condition that he's been managing since birth or since, or not since birth, but since he was like a toddler, um, you know, using his, his, his nascent uh, telekine telekinetic mutant abilities. And she was like, that's really interesting to me. And, you know, my wife is not a comics reader. Um, I give her all my scripts to make sure that a normal human being can understand what I'm writing. Um, so the fact that she was like, oh, yeah, like there's something to that. Like what what goes it through somebody's head if you're constantly every day fighting for survival that that you don't know if, if today is going to be it. Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of what happens when suddenly that inner turmoil which I think Cable has has spent all these years being this sort of ultra macho X Man to kind of hide that uh, that that inner turmoil. What happens when it gets externalized when you meet people who mm -hmm. who share that same rare condition? And what happens, you know, when you know the worst happens? Um, yeah. How do you how do you how do you step in? How do you save each other? Um, so I think that's a really poignant um, kind of undercurrent to our series, but I think it's one that ultimately makes this whole romance work. Um, it is really sort of, it's not just a star-crossed romance. It is a little bit of a doomed romance, um, and, you know, with, with between two people sharing the same common experience that Cable never thought he would share with anybody else. Um, and so I think that's been it's been a lot of fun. Um, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm very excited for people to get to see this and for people to get to see uh, how, how Mike brings all these characters to life. Cause he's been doing some really cool stuff so far. Yeah. No, I mean, like I said, this sounds incredible. So yeah. I mean, I, I know already, I already know I'm going to be picking this up and one book I can't let you leave without giving us an update on the OZ. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I'm so excited. We're going to be doing a Kickstarter for that in 2025. I'm so sorry for any of our Yellow Brick Road Warriors. I know uh, we've been a little slow on the updates for that. Um, you know, it was sort of a, a one-two punch of I was not expecting Space Ghost. Uh, I, I could not have prepared for the uh, overwhelming response that we got to that book. And, and I very quickly realized I had to change plans to make sure that that book got the spotlight that it needed to survive. I also wanted to make sure that uh, OZ artist Ruben Rojas has has as much time as he needs to, to finish drawing the book. Um, he's almost finished uh, with inks on the series right now. I think he's got, I don't know, um, six pages left, I think. Um, so he's he's almost done with it. The book has obviously been long written. Um, so I'm very excited. Uh, also between that and then um, I just got married. <laughs> and um, I, thank you. Uh, and and pragmatically, I did not want to ask all my friends and family um, uh, who just flew up for my wedding to uh, then uh, pitch in on a Kickstarter uh, <laughs> uh, for my wedding. Um, so we we will be doing a Kickstarter in 2025, though. Rest assured, we've already got all our covers ready. 
Um, the book, like I said, has long been written. The art is almost finished. Um, we wanted to make sure that it was worth the wait and that also um, our readers did not have to wait any longer than they had to. Um, you know, once this Kickstarter is done, my aim is to have that in the printer's hands, um, you know, as soon as as soon as the, the, the money comes in. So, um, yes, lots of fun stuff coming for that one. Um, you know, Dorothy and, and her, 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 her rebel band, um, mm. big things are afoot, uh, uh, things are going to come to a head, uh, with the, with the Scarecrow's armies. Um, as we saw at the end of our last issue, uh, Dorothy and her team are in some pretty dire straits, mm. um, and it's only going to get worse before it gets better. Uh, but yeah, Ruben is drawing the absolute hell out of this book. Um, you know, he's doing such a phenomenal job. He actually just sent me another page um, uh, earlier this week. Um, so yeah, he's doing the work of his career. And uh, I can't wait for readers to get to see our, our, our big epic finale for this series. Yeah, I am uh, being somebody that's, that's been fortunate enough to get those issues. I have been chomping at the bit to see about like how this all wraps up. Like this has been something I've been like, okay, where, where are we going to hear about this? Like, <laughs> like yes. marking down the days. Oh so, yes. Uh, uh, you know, I, it's, it's, it's funny. I, I was thinking about it and I'm like, oh, I'm working on like, like six different books right now in various stages of things. And, and like OZ is, is very high up on the list. And there are some books that you don't even know about yet. Um, but yeah, OZ, you know, that, that book is my baby. Uh, the, the, the way that our Kickstarter backers have, uh, really risen to the occasion, uh, for both of our campaigns. And I want our readers to know that, uh, we've been working on this, um, this, I promise it is not, uh, uh any of us slacking the book. Like I said, uh, I finished writing that book, um, before Scouts Honor came out. Hmm. So it's been in the works for a long time. It's just, we want to make sure that Ruben and Whitney and Dave Hopkins, um, that they, you know, they have the time to really put out the best work possible um, because they feel so strongly about this book. They feel just as strongly as I do. And so um, I, I, I want to thank all of our backers for their continued patience for uh, for part three. I promise it is still coming and um, it will 100 percent be worth the wait. If we don't talk to you sooner before that, when that book launches for Kickstarter, let's make oh, sure you're, you're booked on here. Yes. You, you, you guys will, I will be talking about that book nonstop during the campaign. So uh, rest assured, um, you, I will be shouting, uh, uh, shouting from the rooftops about it. Oh yeah, no, but we'll definitely be having you on here to talk about that book and the many, many or that are coming out because honestly, your work stands out for itself. It's always one that no matter where you're diving into horror with the devil that wears my face, or action with Savage Avengers, which I'm still keeping my fingers crossed that you're going to be doing a Cloak and Dagger series at some point, because <laughs> I need that after reading your run on this, <laughs> you know, to the OZ, the creativity that you pour into every book, and especially with Space Book and, or Space Ghost, and taking that to a whole different level. Like, I mean, fans just know that it's a safe bet to pick up whatever you're doing, and that's why everybody should be supporting you at the shops. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who's watching and everyone who's listening and everyone who's been supporting my books. Um, you know, this really... Uh, it's it's the fans that that get me out of bed every day um, to 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 keep writing and uh, to try to keep delivering my A game. So um, thank you all for 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 supporting it. I mean, I'm I'm a fan first and foremost, and I know exactly how exciting it is to to get up every week and read the new books. I mean, I was reading comics every week at my local grocery store when I was a kid. Mm. Um, you know, I'm a third generation comics fan, and so um, I'm one of you. Um, and, and I, 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 I don't forget where I came from and I want to earn your, your dollar. Um, so, um, thank you for, for giving me a shot and for continuing to support my work. Oh, absolutely, David. And especially everybody should be making sure to go to the comic shops, wherever you, you watch this or you hear this, the first opportunity you get, make sure you go and check out Space Ghost. Make sure you go pick up those issues. It is well worth it. It has action as heart. It has everything you're looking for in a superhero book and then some. And trust me, you will not be disappointed by what you're reading. Like this has truly been a, an amazing ride thus far. And I can only imagine where we're going after that. Space. Stay tuned. Yes. Stay tuned. <laughs> so that being said, me, we'll end this like we always do on behalf of Tom, David and myself. David, thank you again for coming on the show. Pleasure. And remember when you're at the comic shops and you have a great issue in your hands, such as Space Ghost from Dynamite Comics, and you see somebody struggling to find something, hand yours off to him. Tell him to turn the page. We'll see you next week. I'm out. Sir.
much waste of time Swiping left and swiping right on people you could know Cause anyone who's worth a damn be worth way more than a picture could ever show You can find the right light, find the right angle And never find your soul And it can feel like a losing battle And this plot is full of holes This modern way of finding love Just makes me feel so alone And I can't be the only one Sick of staring at my phone So look up Talk to me A better way to spend our energy Just look up Talk to me time fable everyone has just one true love all i know is you're across this table and you're all i'm thinking of so look up talk to me a better way to spend our energy just look up Swiping left and swiping right on people you could know. Whoa, oh.